hydrogen to helium in a manner akin to that used in hydrogen bombs. And in the centers of some stars, only to a very limited extent in the center of our own sun, which is relatively cool, in the center of some stars, the process goes farther and the nuclei of other elements, aluminum and uh, iron and carbon and nitrogen and so forth, are also formed by a continuation of the same thermonuclear process. So stars and our sun supply energy. They are also the factories, if you like, for the nuclei of new elements. They're also the center of gravitational attraction for planets. That is to say, we know our own sun as a center of gravitational attraction for our own solar system. And we assume it's probably the same for the other stars that we can see. We can't see their planets because the light reflected from the surface of the planets, if they're there, is too dull for us to see. But we have detected the wobble of some suns as they rotate. And that's interpreted to mean that their gravity is being affected by the attraction of planets which are circulating around them. So our sun then is the center of a solar system of nine planets. And on this scale, if this is the sun, the Earth, instead of being this size and here, ought to be the size of a small p about, oh, 80 feet away. And the farthest planet from the sun, Pluto, should be about half a mile away and the size of a small pinhead. And remember what I said about galaxies being space, the nearest star in our galaxy on that scale would be, well, we're in Sudbury in northern Ontario. Would it perhaps be in the prairies? No, it would be even farther than that. The nearest star on this scale would be somewhere in the Pacific off the coast of Vancouver. Let's have a look at some of the characteristics of the planets of our sun. The planets are regularly spaced in an almost flat disk and all orbit in an anti-clockwise direction around the sun. The inner four, including Earth, are heavy and rocky. Where the fifth should be, there's only a band of debris, the asteroid belt beyond which are the enormous outer four, the mysterious gas giants and tiny Pluto. Jupiter, the largest of the four, has a dense and turbulent 800 mile thick atmosphere of hydrogen and ammonia crystals. Ringed Saturn, nearly 900 million miles from the sun, is the next. In 1979, Pioneer 11, launched in 1973, will visit this spectacular planet and might even photograph sunrise over Saturn if it survives the rigorous journey. Third of the gas giants, Uranus, rotates on its side and it and its moons circle the sun like a fallen gyroscope. And finally, Neptune, nearly three billion miles from the sun, the smallest of the typical outer planets. The Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft, launched in 1972 and 73, were faster than any previous craft, traveling at a million miles per day and passing the moon in just 11 hours, but still taking two years to reach Jupiter. The craft each carried about 65 pounds of scientific instruments to measure such things as ultraviolet and infrared radiation, magnetic fields, and the number of particles which struck the craft, all powered by less electricity than needed for a 25-watt light bulb. A radio dish transmitted data back to Earth and also received command signals from Earth. Approaching Jupiter, the spacecraft took the first close-up pictures of Jupiter's clouds of ammonia crystals suspended in gaseous hydrogen. The clouds form the light zones, which are higher and colder than the dark bands. The dark spot on this photograph is the shadow of one of Jupiter's moons, Io. The famous red spot seems to be a hurricane like storm, which has persisted for over 300 years. It's about 25,000 miles across, and three Earths would not cover it. At its closest, the Pioneer 10 spacecraft approached to within 81,000 miles of the cloud tops. 
the spacecraft detected high intensity bolts of atomic particles apparently wobbling up and down and somehow related to the strong magnetic field which surrounds the planet up to four million miles away. Computers had to be used to produce the spectacular pictures of Jupiter. Because of its rapid rotation, once every 10 hours, and because so much of it is liquid, Jupiter is quite flattened at the poles. One puzzle which still remains is the nature of the chemical which gives the dark, apparently lower belts of gas, their distinctive yellow-brown color. Pioneer 10's successor, Pioneer 11, will travel beyond Jupiter, and if all goes well, will reach Saturn in late 1979. If it returns pictures, we will learn much more about Saturn's glittering 40,000 mile broad rings. Someday a landing vehicle may even descend on Io, one of Jupiter's moons, at first discovered by Galileo. If it lands as the sun strikes Io, after being hidden by Jupiter, it may be able to record one of the most dramatic sights in the solar system. During its hours in the frigid darkness, Io's thin atmosphere seems to snow out onto the barren, possibly salt and sulfur-covered surface. When the sun appears, it flashes from solid ice directly back into gas in the space of just a few moments. Of the outer planets, only Pluto, the outermost of the planets, is an oddball. Pluto is apparently rocky, rather like Io, that moon of Jupiter. And in fact, Pluto is possibly an escaped moon, an escaped moon of Neptune, in fact, and not really an original planet comparable with the others in the solar system at all. The remaining outer planets, the four remainder, are all gassy. The bulk of their makeup is gassy hydrogen or ammonia or ice. They're quite, quite different from the planet that we live on, quite, quite different from the inner planets. Jupiter, in fact, contains the bulk of the mass of the solar system outside the sun. And in many ways, one can look at the solar system as a two-body system, the sun and Jupiter. So enormous is Jupiter. Saturn, one of the most beautiful of the, the planets because of its rings that you saw, is a very, very light planet. In fact, if one could find an ocean big enough, one could put Saturn in it and it would float. The other two, Neptune and Uranus, are, as you saw, much smaller, um, not at all comparable to Jupiter and Saturn in size. Let's have a look at the structure of those very different gassy outer planets. Jupiter probably has a small, rocky core. And outside that is highly compressed hydrogen. Highly compressed because of the enormous pressure it's under. And then, finally, the outer shell of Jupiter is liquid hydrogen. And above that is the atmosphere of Jupiter, formed probably of several shells. At first, water in the form of droplets, and then ice crystals. And then the shell succeeding that water shell is a compound of ammonia and sulfur, ammonium hydrosulfide, in fact. And then the next shell is formed of ammonia crystals.